Hi, I'm Prof L. Welcome to Chemistry Matters. Today we're going to be talking about the atom, the fundamental building block of all matter. So, atoms were first proposed way back a few thousand years ago, in fact. The word atom itself comes from the Greek word atomos, meaning not cut. And way back when, uh, there were some Greek philosophers who basically proposed that everything uh, in the universe was made of these tiny, tiny little indivisible things that they then called atoms. Now, they were philosophers, they didn't have any scientific proof about this, so um, it took another, in fact, a few thousand years before we got scientific proof of the existence of atoms, and that had to wait until the late 19th, early 20th century. And uh, today, we know 118 different types of atom, and there they are there, laid out on this thing that you all know, the periodic table. And one of the things that always amazes me is that in order to construct a universe, you only need 118 building blocks. There they all are. The proof of the sort of modern day uh, idea of the atom came from a very, very famous experiment carried out by a very, very famous uh, scientist. He just happened to be a New Zealander. His name was Ernest Rutherford, and his experiment was a thing called the gold foil experiment. What he did was he took a sheet of gold foil and he shot these things called alpha particles at it. Okay, first up, why did he choose gold? Well, gold has a particular property, as do all metals, of being both malleable and ductile. In other words, you can hammer it out into thin sheets or you can draw it into very, very thin wires, or very, very long wires, in fact. And uh, the malleability of gold means that you can hammer it out into a sheet that's literally a few atoms thick. And that's what he was using. And he was using these very, very energetic particles called alpha particles to shoot at the gold foil. So you can see a setup of the experiment here. Here is the uh, source of alpha particles. This is a radioactive source. Here is your gold foil. And around here is a fluorescent screen that glows every time one of these alpha particles hits it. Rutherford started off by shooting these alpha particles at the gold foil, and it was pretty dull actually, because what he found was that most of the alpha particles pretty much went straight through that very, very thin sheet. Now, that wasn't the interesting part of the experiment. The interesting part of the experiment were the few alpha particles that actually got deflected. What happened was that some alpha particles were deflected at different angles from the gold foil. Some were out here, some were out here. And in fact, a very small number were deflected straight back at the source. And that surprised Rutherford uh, very, very much. He made a very famous quote about uh, shooting a gun on a ship at a piece of tissue paper and the um, shell bouncing back straight uh, towards you from the tissue paper. And it took him, in fact, a couple of years to figure out what this experiment meant. What he derived, I guess, from the results of this experiment were the following. Number one, most of the atom is empty space. And he gets that from the fact that he's shooting these alpha particles through the gold foil. Most of them go through undisturbed. They don't get deflected at all. Now, some do get deflected. How do we explain that? Okay, these alpha particles have a positive charge. Now, what do we know about positive charges, we know that they don't like other positive charges. If you bring two positive charges together, they repel each other. And so Rutherford said to himself, okay, there must be some massive positively charged region of the atom, because that's what's causing the deflection. Most of the mass must lie in this positively charged region. We're going to call that the nucleus of the atom. And that is why things get deflected, because we've got these alpha particles that are coming close to another positively charged region, and they're gonna get deflected. Now, if they hit it bang on, if they hit the nucleus, the positively charged nucleus bang on, they're gonna bounce straight back. And so this all made sense. And this then became Rutherford's model of the atom. And he said that the atom was made up of a central, massive, positively charged nucleus, and that had most of the mass of the atom, and then around that was mostly empty space that was inhabited by the negatively charged region of the atom, the electrons, or the negatively charged component of the atom. Here we have a picture of 
what we sort of understand by the atom now. When we say most of the atom is empty space, it really, really is, okay? So a typical atom's got a diameter, as you can see, of around about 10 to the minus 10 meters. The nucleus has a diameter of around about 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's five orders of magnitude. What does that mean in practical terms, so terms that we can visualize? Well, roughly speaking, uh, we could liken uh, the atom to, let's say, a sports stadium. In the middle of the stadium, we have a P, and the rest of the atom is that sports stadium. Okay, so you can see it's quite, quite enormous. So really, pretty much all of the atom is absolutely empty space. Chemistry-wise, there are three components to an atom, okay? There's protons, which live in the nucleus, and they are positively charged. There are neutrons, which also live in the nucleus, and they are electrically neutral. And there are electrons, and they sort of occupy sort of that vast amount of empty space, and they're very, very small. Here in this table, you can see that uh, the masses of the proton and the neutron, roughly the same, pretty much, and they are much, much greater, four orders of magnitude, than the mass of the electron, okay? The electron negatively charged and the proton equal and opposite positive charge. Those are the masses of the constituents of the atom. Uh, every neutron weighs the same, every proton weighs the same, every electron weighs the same. And so what this means is that every atom is going to have its own particular mass. And that is an extraordinarily important concept in all of chemistry, as we will see, the masses of all of the individual atoms, okay? And so scientists, once they knew the constituents of the atom, defined a thing that they called the atomic mass unit. And that has a symbol U. And they said that this was equal to exactly 1 12th of the mass of an atom of carbon that we're gonna designate in this way, we're gonna call it carbon 12, six, okay? Or just carbon 12, in fact, is what we call it. So one unit, or one atomic mass unit, is equal to 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay, so you can see that that is a tiny, tiny value. Very, very small. But the usefulness of this is that now we can measure the mass of any atom in a relative sense, okay? Rather than having to talk about 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, which is way, way, way too small, let's talk about it in terms of sort of nice sort of numbers that we can get a handle on. So, for example, if we had an atom of fluorine 19, on this relative scale, we would say that that weighs 18.998403 atomic mass units. Okay, in other words, one atom of fluorine 19 is that multiplied by this kilograms in mass, okay? So this is the relative scale here. So fluorine 19 would weigh that, one atom of fluorine 19 would weigh that, one atom of phosphorus 31 would weigh 30.973762 atomic mass units as well. So this, as I say, gives us a relative scale for atomic masses. And this, as I said, the, the whole concept of the atomic mass is extremely, extremely important in chemistry. And we will certainly be coming back to this in subsequent videos. So hopefully um, you can get your head around this particular scale. And uh, as I say, we'll meet them again soon. And so on that note, we'll end our discussion of the atom and we'll see you next time.